I think one of the things that unites all uh, politicians and all former premiers that have come here to the site or have met with Ralph is that we all truly believe in uh, reconciliation. We all truly believe in uh, what the artists are doing and we all you know, want to do our part in one way or another. And Friends United has grown from, from its, its inception when, uh, when Ralph had the vision of what it could be and now for what it is. Friends United said it all. You know, it, it, it didn't matter, you know, the color of your skin. It didn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Those messages are important. And every time I drive across the Cancel Causeway, I think of what Ian did and making sure uh, the welcome message for First Nations communities are here. And, and, uh, and, I, and I think that's something that, he, you know, he can be proud of. It seems like a symbolic thing, but it is. It's profound. It is, and it was uh, driven by um, Mi'kmaq people that wanted to see it there. And I think that's important. It was uh, especially Elder Moggett, who actually just recently uh, passed away. But she was uh, a residential school survivor, and it was her dream to, to see that. There is so much to learn that from people that have been here over 10,000 years. And, and the consistency of what they've been telling us is, is remarkable and um, they, I think we just need to listen. That would be <laughs> the main part, I think, to learn. And this is not a tourism initiative here. It's not meant to be, but indirectly it impacts, you know, the visuals that you see around Nova Scotia and, and all the dots connect, you know, the art, you know, the stories, the language. Hello and welcome, Gwe, to the Friends United International Convention Centre in Unamagi, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for joining us for the second annual Friends United Reconciliation Talks. I'm thrilled to be joined now by two former premiers of Nova Scotia, the Honourable Rodney MacDonald and the Honourable Ian Rankin. Thank you. It's my honour to sit here with you today. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, it's, it's great to be here and, and join uh, yourself and, and both and, and Ian, of course, as well. And, and we both have roots in, in the Mabu area, in the western side of Cape Breton. So. And the, the name of this centre, of course, is Friends United, which means so much. And I thought that's such a, a perfect framing of this conversation because you come from different sides of the aisle. But we're joining together in conversation today with a really important purpose. And you, I think, had said you're friends. Yeah, yeah. It goes back before uh, I was born. I, our families, I think, uh, grew up in the same street, back street in Mabu, and uh, lots of connections there musically. And, and uh, so I always thought a lot of Rodney, and I reached out to him before I was elected as an MLA. Um, didn't serve in the house together. Uh, he was retired when, before I was elected, but uh, always stayed in touch. And, uh, I was happy that that he actually introduced me to 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 Rolf in this in this building. So it was uh, it was a good opportunity. And uh, you know, as Ian mentioned, we have we have prob a lot more in common than we, we would uh, uh, on a political level. And different thoughts and different you know policies. Every politician's like that, and and all the different fields. And uh, I think one of the things that unites all uh, politicians and all former premiers that have come here to the site or have met with Ralph, is that we all truly believe in uh, reconciliation. We all truly believe in uh, what the artists are doing. And we all you know, want to do our part in one way or another. And, uh, and I know, you know, having watched Ian during his time as Premier and the steps that he took uh, with First Nations communities, that uh, you know, very well-intentioned and uh, meaningful and uh, so I was very pleased when he came here to the, the center. Mm -hmm. So you introduced him more recently, but you've been hanging around for a while. I've been hanging around since a while. Uh, when Ralph first uh, talked about the initiative and, uh, you know, when we spent time, of course, going around Nova Scotia and speaking with First Nations leadership, um, elected and unelected as well. 
and reaching out to uh, artists and, and uh, you know, speaking with them. And, and I, I learned a lot during that process. Yeah, I, I of course, I was saying it very facetiously that you've been hanging around, but you, you played such a significant role. And, and you learned as you went, as you say. Yeah, I learned a lot. Uh, this has been a, a great uh, uh, journey, if you will, with Ralph and the team and, uh, and just getting to know the artists, I think it's been the most f fulfilling. And, um, you know, I'm a musician. I'm not a, a visual artist in that way, so a different type of artist. And so uh, they wouldn't want to see my paintings <laughs> up in the wall. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think we, we all learned, you know, in different ways and uh, through the process. And, and Friends United has grown from, from its, its inception when, uh, when Ralph had the vision of what it could be and now for what it is. And I think that's, uh, that says a lot about um, his vision for this. But more than that, it wasn't just, I think, his vision. What he did was he listened to what the artists wanted. And he listened to what people wanted. And he took them here. And he opened the doors uh, of that. And so it was, uh, you know, it was, it was somewhat uh, incredible, really. I think that's one of the ways in which this is such a, perfect symbol of one person being able to make huge strides in, in terms of reconciliation. I'm curious to know, Rodney, what are you most excited about seeing going on here? Uh, what I'm most excited about is uh, what the future will be for, for the Centre and for the artists. And uh, what does that mean for them in their own communities? What does that mean for younger people that are going to come along and, and see their artwork if they're walking through the airport in Halifax or if they're, you know, in, a, in the premier's office and, and they see it there or if they're in, you know, in a school and they see it there. What does that mean for them and, and how will that impact their lives, both on a confidence level of I can do this, you know, I, I see Loretta Gould, she did it, I can do it too. And I think that's important. I, I think that's really important for our young people. And, uh, and I think the results are, you know, speak for themselves. That's already started. The confidence. Confidence means a lot. Absolutely. And giving them uh, hope, you know, giving people hope. I, uh, I went to Germany with Rolf and uh, on, on the issue of reconciliation, we, we talked about the Friends United initiative. And of course, there was artists there and such. But there was thousands of pamphlets handed out. And, and the pamphlets, what did they talk about? You know, they talked about, you know, um, missing and murdered Indigenous uh, females. They talked about uh, residential schools. They talked about many of the things that, you know, a, a very important messages getting out there to people. And uh, when I left that uh, trip, I took with it the fact that there's something different happening here. It wasn't just about artwork. It was much bigger. And Friends United said it all. You know, it, it didn't matter, you know, the color of your skin. It didn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Those messages are important and, and they resonate. And it made me think about it, you know, every time we go to do that stuff. And, and every time I drive across the Cancel Causeway, I think of what Ian did and making sure uh, the welcome message for First Nations communities are here and, and, uh, and I, and I think that's something that he, you know, he can be proud of, uh, you know, as everybody enters, you know, enters the island. And that was a special thing, you know. It seems like a symbolic thing, but it is. It's profound. How do you feel about that? It is, and it was uh, driven by um, Mi'kmaq people that wanted to see it there. And I think that's important. It was uh, especially Elder Moggett, who actually just recently uh, passed away but she was uh, a residential school survivor and it was her dream to, to see that. Um, the mayor, uh, Brenda Chisholm Beaton, actually brought the idea to me and uh, we sat in her office in Port Hawkesbury and she thought this uh, would be a, a real meaningful thing for the province to be able to do. And, and yeah, it might seem like something small to, to some people, but uh, it meant everything to to mog it and um and and i think um at large indigenous people um to see that to see the welcome message in their own language and i think language is such a an important part um art is very important but 
to try to keep the language alive, like all cultures, but uh, something that has been intentionally um, taken away from them over generations um, to try to um, to help uh, rebuild and 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 respect. It comes down to respect, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's every time I cross the causeway, which is which is quite often with my roots in in Mabu, I, I do smile when I when I see it, and it's it's something that I think that was important to to do. I spoke with Brenda the other day, along with Karen Bernard, um, about, uh, for one thing, the grandmother's gatherings they've had here. And they had one that was uh, smaller, 30 people, then 50, and now next year it's going to be 100 women talking about female leadership, talking about empowerment. And it, it's just so, it's so exciting to hear about that work being done. I'm curious about, Rodney, you mentioned youth a little while back. I'd like to have you both take me back to your youth in Cape Breton and Unamagi and, and tell me when you were first, do you remember when you first um, either were uh, exposed to Indigenous communities or what you do remember about uh, you from your youth, what you might have learned or not learned about them? Well, I could say myself, I was, I was fortunate to, to grow up in a family that uh, had a lot of respect for, for Indigenous peoples. And, and my, my father worked, uh, although I was born in Cape Breton, we left when I was very young. I, was, I think I was one. And we went up north and lived um, in um, Iqaluit. Uh, and he worked in housing, my father. And then when we came back here, uh, he worked in housing with, with Mi'kmaq people. And so there was always art in my house. Um, from indigenous peoples, and I just always respected that. And and um, and and from, but on the other side, in school, I think uh, we could have done a lot better um, teaching our our kids about treaty education, which we now have in school. We we didn't have that growing up, um, unfortunately. But um, there have been some improvements made, and we need to do a lot more so people understand the treaties that we have. Um, in Nova Scotia and in Mi'kma'ki, but I think what we're doing here in Nova Scotia that transcends all parties can be can be shared so that we can improve uh, from a Canadian perspective and, and and telling the whole story about it. And uh, it's it's something that was lacking, but but I do see improvement. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was uh, I was very lucky going to school because we had a um, uh, a large. Uh, a contingent of individuals that came to school in Mabu from from uh, Wegema, and so many friends of mine uh, going to school uh, were First Nations, and uh, I, I think when you were, when you asked that question, I was thinking about back to uh, a teacher, a former elementary teacher of mine, um, uh, Celeste McPhee was her name, but she did something very wise. We we had a uh, a section in in our class uh, and uh, uh, dealing about First Nations, and she had some high school students that we went to school with come in and talk to us, and and I thought, well, you know, very simple but very eye opening for as a young person uh, to just to ask questions and to learn and to you know to talk about what was in the book, but maybe what was was wasn't in the book. And that's what I got out of that class was it wasn't, you know, and that's what they spoke about. Because, you know, I think what was written about in the book wasn't from the perspective of First Nations. And, and so they opened my eyes that day uh, to that. And I'll never forget that. And so for, for me, I was very lucky as uh, it was very normal, you know, whether you were playing sports, you know, uh, you know, I could look across and my line mate was, you know, uh, was from Wegema. I never thought anything of it. You know, we, we uh, went to school together, we hung out together. And, and, uh, and um, so in that regard, and then of course had uh, the f- good fortune to represent them as, a, as an MLA and go to every house. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was another eye, eye opener for me to, to go inside of every door and, and to, to hear firsthand what was working and what wasn't working. And uh, you know, in that regards, or as a teacher, as well in a, in a First Nations community. And, uh, you know, I, I realized, although I was an hour away from the community I taught in, I, I felt like a million miles away. Yeah. Because 
the issues that they were dealing with were not the same as I was dealing with at home. I wasn't dealing with near the issues they were dealing with. And, uh, and it gave me a better appreciation for, uh, for, you know, I guess how little I did know. What I thought I knew, I didn't know. And yeah, you, you know, if you look at the recommendations, they are split between acknowledgments, understanding, and action. And that's so key, you know, how can you take action without understanding? And how can you understand without immersing yourself? I'm curious to know for both of you how your vision of reconciliation or the concept, the word, differs now from what it might have been 10 years ago because of everything we know and everything that came out through the commission and so on. Yeah, well, I think it's it's to be a lifelong learner uh, helps and listening to to, to um, indigenous peoples themselves and the concepts of two-eyed seeing. Uh, I think are becoming more widely known. Where you have the Western lens that we all have been accustomed to, and including uh, indigenous traditional knowledge in uh, in our policies, having. Um, in our case, Mi'kmaq at the table on boards are, is so important. Um, when we talk about art and, and people seeing their own art, it's also important for uh, people to see themselves reflected in, in our institutions. And I, I think that has been something that I've, I've learned and, and really tried to emphasize when we're making policy changes. And uh, I think that that's going to set the foundation for, for better um, better laws and better approval processes for things in our province. And, um, and, but we need to continue to learn. There is so much to learn that from people that have been here over 10,000 years. And, and the consistency of what they've been telling us is, is remarkable. And um, they, I think we just need to listen. That would be <laughs> the main part, I think, to learn. And do you feel like there is a, a much greater willingness to listen now in the political world? I do. I, I, I see it in all three parties. I, I see some improvement, but it's, it's up to all of us, and I think, collectively to, to help educate um, people um, so they can understand, again, what has happened, where we've come from, and, and what there is to do. Mm -hmm. Rodney? Yeah, I think, I think the acknowledgement is much greater today, and, uh, and I think over the last 10 years, the um, I think it's important for the, the, the political, those in political life and, and just the public in general, first of all, to acknowledge uh, what has, you know, what the past wrongs, if you will, um, and uh, what the real story is. Um, the acceptance of that, I think, is, you know, it's easy not to accept that and to pretend it's not, it didn't happen or, or it's not happening today. So I think the acknowledgement, the acceptance, and then, you know, moving forward. And uh, I, you know, I, I believe that all the political parties and, and the governments, um, you know, have had to open their, their eyes, you know, and, uh, and our governments included, you know, uh, whether it was one that Ian was leading or I was leading or, or others. And, um, you know, you're, you're not changing a, a year or two of history, you're changing hundreds of years. Of, of history and change happens slowly but a huge change I think in the last decade or so that I see you know and uh, and uh, and I think that change I mean I noticed that in the Gaelic community and I, and I can use that as a connection just because to understand say where my parents generation would be having grew up with a loss or your parents Ian in our, both our cases which was much different than our grandparents' generation who, you know, for instance, language-wise, who were native speakers. And there was a feeling for them that, and I, and I think it's the same in, in, First Nation, in many First Nations communities, that all of a sudden there was a loss of a lot of language and, and, and cultural identity in that way. And then, so they were made to feel like, well, you have to learn other ways. You have to, you know, you have to do what the white man is doing. You have to fit in or you want to do well economically and socially. And, and, and that wasn't right, you know, and, and I see that change today in, in the generation, 
Our, our generation helped start that, I, I think, in a lot of ways. And the younger generation, our kids, it's going to be different for them. And I think in a positive way. So there's acknowledgments, you know, that you, you, you have to promote, uh, you know, the artwork, but there's, it goes well beyond that, you know, the language you know, and how important it is to, to make sure that it's preserved in, in First Nations communities. And beyond that, you know, the cultural aspects and the training. And I think the great thing about Friends United is that, you know, Ralph has done more than just talk, uh, you know, you know, talk about it, you know, it's whether it's videotaping someone making quill baskets or, you know, or, or making sure that there's something set aside for education, that, that's part of Friends United. And, and so it, it's a legacy that goes well beyond, you know, the painting on the wall. It's very action oriented. I mean, you know, he will sponsor artists to come and live here and they can focus on just doing their art without having to worry about paying rent or buying food or having a vehicle to use. And, and that's a profound thing to all of a sudden give someone who's usually had a lot of pressure on them just to survive the opportunity to just be and to be creative. You, you know, you said the loss of their language. And in my mind, I right away thought the theft, not the loss, but the theft. And that is, that is a subjective thing, but it reminds me that and I, this is a very personal thing for me to say, but I have noticed in the past couple of Canada days that I have a very different feeling about my Canadian patriotism since the discovery of the unmarked graves at residential schools. And, and I, wonder, I wonder how that has impacted you, if I can ask you know, that kind of a personal question. Well, I think most people... Um, should recognize that Canada Day is more than just a celebration now and it's a time to reflect on our history and it's not all it's not all positive um, and I think that that's uh, very important for and I think younger people are driving that conversation I, I think Rodney touched on what's next for, for younger people um, you know the internet generational trauma that that has been um, I think not not a lot of people realize that it's or not enough people realize that it was very intentional on behalf of our governments and of the past it was it was very it was in law to assimilate people um, and so that's that's that could be hard um, to reconcile and uh, I think the acknowledgement piece is is part of that um, so Canada Day uh, has to has to include that it has to include the voices of indigenous peoples if we are going to move forward. Uh, together with the recommendations, and it's it's it should really bring out other sentiments than than, than traditionally what we what we thought was just a celebration. Mm, I love that perspective. It's not just the raw raw that that often we uh, associate with the U.S. You yes. know, July Fourth. It's a, it's a more introspective potential possibility. Yeah, I, th I think it's caused, uh, and I think the the, the the wonderful part about what Ian's saying about causing us to reflect on it is it's caused us to reflect on not even just First Nations culture, but all cultures mm -hmm. to, to, to say, OK, you know, let's let's take a look at our history and, and you know, Friends United, you know, let, let's take a look at the, 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 the whole aspect of it. And it, it's caused, you know, I know certainly me to reflect on those things as an individual. And I'm sure others as well, and governments, you know, to reflect on that. And that's, that's good. That's a very good thing. Um, how we take it from there, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's the next question as a country. And uh, it, I think, you know, it's probably been a very positive thing for, for, for uh, Aboriginal First Nations people as well. Because sometimes you also, there's an acknowledgement of everybody, including uh, First Nations, that it's okay uh, to acknowledge that, you know, certain things happened in your parents' life, your grandparents' life. And it's, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, to talk about it openly, 
And not only that, but to, to, you know, to take a different route if that's, if that's what you want to do as an individual and as a community to make things better uh, for your community rather than feel like our parents generation of, Oh no, we, sh we can't talk about that. You know, we, we need to, we need just to push that to the side. Suppress it. Suppress it. And, and young people today, that's not where they're at. And it's very normal for them, you know, to talk about it and to openly talk about it. So that's, you know, that, that's, uh, that's one of the successes I think of the initiative here in, in a lot of ways. It's just normalized certain things. It's very normal to get off the plane and see beautiful First Nations artwork where 20 years ago that didn't happen. It's very normal to... Uh, Having it at the Stanfield International Airport, that was a huge step, I think, in, symbolically, in terms of saying, welcome to Nova Scotia, the land of Mi'kma'ki. And you, and you watch the news and you're watching, you know, for instance, if it's Patrick Lamy being interviewed on the news and what's behind him is, you know, a beautiful painting, one of the many beautiful paintings at, at the law firm or others, you know, and, you know, that are involved in different walks of life. So that's, uh, I, I notice even talking to different individuals in different communities that at first when Friends United started, understandably, there was a bit of unease about not knowing what it would mean, not knowing whether somebody was trying to take advantage mm -hmm. of the artists or others. That conversation is much different today. In fact, it doesn't even rarely enter. I, I never hear that anymore compared to at first. Well, there are so many stakeholders now in the Indigenous community who understand that he, Rolf is for real, and this is a really uh, you know, amazing project. Yeah, and, and, uh, and those that have come into the center, as you mentioned, grandmothers and others and uh, people in the community, economic development officers, whatever it might be, they understand it uh, as well. And, and they've gotten to know on that personal relationship with, with Rolf and other members uh, you know, that are involved. And I think that's, that's given a comfort level that this is real. It's not, uh, it's not a figment of the imagination. It's, you know, it's, it's the buildings here, but it's more than that. It's actions, as you mentioned earlier, and actions speak louder than words. I loved the story you told about being in elementary school and having the teenage Indigenous youth come into the elementary grade and talk about what it was to be Indigenous. And I thought when you were saying that, that, you know, not only was that great for the little kids who were learning it, but for the, for the representatives who were coming in to talk about their culture and to be respected and, and listened to and seen. And I, I think that's also what goes on here. I think that's part of, you know, the, uh, we talked to, uh, I talked to Carrie Prosper about um, Sandra Simon's quill baskets you mentioned. And he, he said that, you know, he watched her not only improve in her art, but he saw her self-esteem change in such a dynamic way when her art was here and, and being shown off and, and, you know, proudly displayed. It meant so much to her as a human being to be seen in that way. That's powerful. Why did you get into politics? There's a, there's a, that's a quick turn, well, but it's connected, a, trust yeah, me. That's a common question. I, for me, it was about my community and just trying to make a difference very much at the local level and, and improving schools and more opportunities for recreation for kids growing up that, that I didn't have as much at the time. The, Timberley was a kind of a, a much smaller community when I was growing up and it's kind of exploded on the cusp of Halifax, the suburbs there. and so. I was uh, fortunate to be uh, elected, and um, but I've always kept um, the principle of trying to help people, and especially people that um, were disenfranchised or, or people that, that needed some just a just a leg up once in a while. And, and um, I think that 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 was a such a still is a privilege. And becoming premier was just 
taking that to the level of, of province-wide and, and even serving as a minister in, in pretty important departments, environment especially, passion of mine. And I think all those things are connected. It comes back to, to public service, as, as you would know, growing up in a, in a family that, that has served the public over generations. I think it's just so important um, that I just couldn't say no to all of those opportunities for myself. Well, like, like Ian, I grew up in a, a house where we had municipal politicians for fathers. Yeah. And so you, you couldn't really get away from <laughs> uh, many of the things that were happening. But the benefit of that was seeing the difference like local community projects could make and, and, and organizations and that sort of thing. So, you know, like Ian, you know, you get into it to make a difference for people in your community. I. I, I haven't seen anyone get into the political arena uh, that haven't been, you know, entered it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, genuinely, I feel, regardless of what party they run for, whatever it might be, they're there to make a difference for the people they represent. Sometimes it's a project that they, they say, well, I really want to see this project happen. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it wasn't that. Uh, it wasn't a particular project. It was many, many projects or just wanting to help out, you know, and, and trying to get, give opportunity. Uh, at the time when my son, uh, when I got elected, my son was uh, about a year and a half old. Wow. And, uh, and so. Sound familiar, Ian? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Ian has a, Mine just turned one, yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. So it's, your perspective starts turning to, okay, you know, what's life going to be like for them when they're, you know, when they graduate in school or graduate from school, like, what can we do to make, you know, our local arena better? What can we do to make our school better? Or what can we do to improve roads so there's economic opportunity, you know? And, and then you translate that further, you become in cabinet. I was like Ian, becoming a young cabinet minister. And then beyond that, you become a young premier. And we are both young premiers. And it's hard to believe we're close to the same age. No, we're not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then you have a different perspective, I think, as a young premier. And, uh, and that's a positive. We've had some, some fairly young premiers in the last few years, relatively speaking. So. Mm -hmm. so one of the answers I hear there, if I'm reading between the lines, is dealing with inequality, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to fix issues of inequality. And when you think about our indigenous cultures in Canada, there are so many fronts on which we need to make a lot of progress, whether it's justice or, or health and wellness or the moderate fishery, whatever that means, you know, that, that uh, the issue of that being so open to interpretation. Um, where do you start? Can you be Monday morning quarterbacks as people who are no longer premiers. I know you're still in politics, but um, can, can you give me an idea of your vision of, of how you start to really make a difference on all those fronts? Well, I think you don't try to boil the ocean, as they say. I like that phrase. You try to work with people and, and realize that you're in these offices for a finite amount of time. Um, Mine was, was pretty short, but it was in the context of COVID, which completely highlighted um, the inequalities that you reference in our society. And you just have to try to look justice. You mentioned that that's a huge one with, with such over-representation of uh, Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotians that are incarcerated. Like that, those are societal issues that, that have been because of systemic racism. And sometimes that's hard for people to, to even say. Um, so I made a part of like my leadership campaign going into the office to create institutional changes with the new office of equity and anti-racism and, and making sure that you have leadership from indigenous people at the table. Um, and so those structural changes I think can set in motion long-term initiatives so the the new government has kept that office in place uh, and i think there's going to be wonderful initiatives uh, that are continuing in fact like disaggregated data when you're talking about health outcomes they, they are now measuring with the group that i put together um, which goes beyond indigenous communities but allows um, 
measurement of, of what's happening in, in the health system so that policy can be changed to to start to make those changes and and sometimes that was my it, next takes, question. it takes patience so, <laughs> you're so. reading my mind because you know there was a time my impression is there was a time when we didn't want to ask about race in terms of getting data but now we're realizing how important it is in order to address the issues we've got to know about them it's that again it's the acknowledgement understanding before you can take action yeah you need, you need good information uh, you need good research um, you know, if you're, if you're developing something, you need the research, then you need whatever, I guess, that product is, if you will. And then you need to take it beyond that to, uh, to, you know, to market it or to make sure you educate in the correct way or, you know, whatever it might be. And I, I was thinking of something in Nova Scotia, the last 50, 60, 70 years since we've been uh, marketing it as a tourism destination, how little of that marketing was for indigenous communities Absolutely. and and how unfair that was especially probably from 1940 to you know 2000 uh where where you know there was a particular focus and it didn't include first nations community and how wrong that was i, I was thinking about um in 1995 i i was uh, as a school teacher i took a at an exchange with another teacher and we went to scotland but the group that came from Plockton, Scotland, here, the, the teacher and the students, what, what was it they wanted to do? They went to Wagama and they, they made a visit and that was the highlight of their trip. Wasn't about coming to visit, uh, you know, the other students and that's what they wanted to do. You know, at the time, I, it made me, it made, it, it kind of, I stepped back a little bit because I re, I started realizing that what they wanted to see was the culture that was here, mm -hmm. not not the culture that came from Scotland, <laughs> you know, or, or other countries. They could see that, you know, at home. But what was unique here was what was in, you know, Wegema and Eskazoni and Membertu and, and all these communities. And it was very different for them. And I thought that that was a, you know, it was a real eye opener. And it took them to say it to me to, to you know, to click into that and to, so I think we're starting to do a better job in the last you know, number of years. In the last, you know, 20 years in Nova Scotia, I think there's much more. You know, it's it's beginning, and there's much more assistance in developing. You know, uh, you know, great trail systems, if you will, or or you know, make sure the stories are told at different centers, and and you know, and this is not a tourism initiative here, and it's not meant to be, but indirectly it impacts you know, the visuals that you see around Nova Scotia and, and all the dots connect, you know, the art, you know, the stories, the language, I mean, North American indigenous games yeah, next nice. summer. Uh, yeah. How wonderful is that? And that's, that's an exciting, you know, thing for Halifax. It's exciting for Nova Scotia. It's exciting for uh, youth ath athletes, you know. It's, you know, for me, it's about pride so much and and if you think about how uh canadian indigenous people were shamed and and just told they their culture was worth nothing you know this is about breathing life back into the the pride that they should feel and that we should all feel and i'm i am looking forward to that so much i'm aware again that you two are on different sides of the aisle politically and I have to say that the party system is no party these days in politics. It's such a divisive world. I'm curious about what you think government in Canada or anywhere can learn from a model of governance in the indigenous cultures. I think the word respect, uh, respect of uh, elders, respect of uh, community and the importance of, of, you know, listening to others in the community and being respectful. I mean, I, I think, you know, whether it's in the House of Assembly in Halifax or if you're in Ottawa, um, we, we need to really step up the game as, as, uh, as, you know, as governments and as politicians to make sure that it's always a respectful dialogue. 
And at the same time, there's a respectful dialogue to be respectful of each other as individuals, regardless of where we come from, regardless, you know, of our walk of life. And um, so I think respect. I think there's a, a real respect in First Nations communities of each other and of other communities. And a sharing that is underlying there that we, we haven't fully appreciated. And so that's, I guess that's the word that comes to my mind on, on that level. And uh, of course, I'm out of the political arena these days. So, uh, but uh, Ian's in the hot seat. <laughs> Ian's in the hot seat <laughs> all the time. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's something that's important, you know. To keep in mind. Yeah, increasing the dialogue amongst different orders of government. And uh, I mean, I think it was Rodney that brought in the um, the annual meeting with chiefs, with, with the cabinet. I think that just shows the respect, but it shows that you can learn from, from one another on how to, um, how to understand um, what's happening in, in their communities and, and how, to, how we can work together to improve outcomes. And I think that's um, the concepts and the education in schools and the art and representation, institutional change, all of those things I think overlap and are related. Um, you know, people should understand that, that everything is connected and that's something that, that Mi'kmaq here have been telling us and the concept of Ndugalimik, uh, Ndugalimp, and that's, uh, that's an important thing that we're now embedding in laws in Nova Scotia. And I think that's, that's something that um, we should continue to learn from one another and not just focus on that Western um, lens of how we view things. As premiers, you were both also in charge of the Indigenous portfolio, now called Ilnu, yeah, right? Yeah, Ilnu, yeah. How, how did that inform your vision, do you think? And I'm also curious to know if you found it was difficult to pay attention to that sufficiently, being the premier. I didn't. I, I found that it was a respect thing that the, the, the minister that was so-called the highest of the government, the premier, saw that as being equivalent that, that the premier should be um, having that very important relationship with uh, the 13 chiefs and staying in, in contact with, with them. Um, we renamed it because it was uh, something that was important after discussing with with chiefs, um, especially here because it's Mi'kma'ki using the language, going back to what we were talking about, how language is important. Um, and uh, there is some symbol symbolism, I think, behind that too, and ensuring that your, your premier is there at the table with the chiefs. And, and, and in my case, we were in lockdown, so it had to be virtual, but I enjoyed the relationship building that actually predated when I was premier because the files of environment and lands and forestry are very close to the issues. Um, so we were able to, to work on things like closing Boat, Boat Harbor down finally and um, uh, the first ever Mi'kmaq forestry initiative where there's 50,000 um, acres of land that, that is under uh, management of, of Mi'kmaq and being able to train. So they're, they're having your hands um, in those important projects and, and the dialogue that I reference is, um, I think it's just important, unless you have another trusted minister that, that, that you think um, will work through that in a way that you, that you would yourself. Um, I think it's, it was just a, an important thing. So in, in, my, in my case, I, I wasn't the minister for Aboriginal affairs. No, but I worked, no, but I, but I, but I worked very closely with the minister and who was Michael Baker at the time. And as premier, you, you get engaged in you know, all the portfolios, of course, especially the cultural ones. Yeah. And, and I had the opportunity to be Minister of Culture for a number of years before that. So Michael Baker um, you know, came from the Lunenburg area and uh, had a legal background, but he also had a history background and from educa an education perspective. He was very, um, critical, if you will, in, in different negotiations around tripartite and being some of the first in, in Canada to have, uh, to have, you know, platforms set aside to, to ensure that there was open dialogue 
and, and open you know, arrangements as far as agreements and such. So I was very fortunate to have Michael there. And, uh, and because of my background as a minister for culture, I was always engaged in those parts of those with the First Nations communities. As well, of course, when you become premier, then you're at another level engaged again. So, uh, yeah, I was not the minister, you know, responsible for Aboriginal Affairs, but very engaged with the minister at, at all those levels. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you were prime minister tomorrow, what would be your first priority on the Indigenous file? Wow, that's a big question. I didn't plan that one, but it feels, it feels important to ask. Yeah, the, I mean, there, there is a lot to tackle, um, especially I would work through the, the truth and reconciliation uh, recommendations. And I, I think um, the way you do that is with, with your representations of the national chief, um, uh, the head of Inuit and the head of uh, Métis. Um, when we went to the territorial provincial um, meetings as, as ministers, at least in my time, we would have representation there for environment um, and they would be part of those discussions um, for part of the day and how you work with them to, to come up with some, some things um, I think could be brought up to the national level and the prime minister should uh, number one is to make sure they're working together. Yeah. One of the, one of the great things as a premier and the premiers uh, of the Federation do uh, before their meetings is, is meet with First Nations leadership before every conference and, and other times throughout the year, but in particular before their annual conference. That was always an eye opener because you get uh, the different representation from different groups across the country and a lot of different perspectives not always agreeing with each other either. So I think as a, a prime minister, uh, the first thing we would do is come to Friends United. <laughs> and meet with the grandmothers. Yes, and meet with the grandmothers. <laughs> and uh, so I'd do that. And, uh, and, uh, and then meet with other groups and get a perspective. Um, I think there's nothing like going into a community and you know going into their school, talking to the students, going into the healthcare, clinic and talking to, you know, the individuals there, uh, going into, uh, you know, the different avenues of the community prison. and just talking to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going to the prison, talk, going, going into, you know, the local gas station, which I often do, uh, uh pretty well, uh, you know, a few times a week and just chat with people. How are things going? What's new? And people want to talk and go talk to the local barber and, and find out, you know, what are they hearing? And, and uh, you know, and, and listening to, to, to individuals, N not just, you know, put the cameras away and that sort of thing, and just get down to the brass tacks of what, what's important. What do you need? You know, what does your family want? And what do you want? Is, it, is what we're doing working? Is it what we're doing not working? And uh, I think we need more of that. That's hard. It would be hard as a prime minister. Uh, but so probably the, the lead up, you know, to, to that, you know. So when Ian becomes prime minister, we can ask him for real. There you go. I love that word, the listening. I mean, really, it's about listening more than talking yeah. Yeah. reconciliation. A friend of mine said, well, you have two ears and one mouth. Yeah. You should do twice as much listening. Yeah. Well, regardless of whether you stay in politics, become prime minister, whether you go back into politics, you both got into, into the system because you wanted to make a difference. Is there anything that you hold as a goal going forward as a human being, not even as a politician, in terms of how you individually can move the boulder or the pebble even on, on the front of reconciliation? Any personal commitments that you hold? Well, I would say I, I, I want to make sure I do better and strive to do better every day. Listen more, uh, learn more, and act more. 
Yeah. S- similarly, I think I, I said it when I was defeated as, as premiers that I, I will never, never stop um, fighting for the underdog and, and for people that have been, you know, th- you mentioned theft. Um, that's, that's what it is. You know, they're, they're, and I think people don't, not everyone understands how much was taken away and the inability for, um, for inheritance of land, um, and to have language taken away and to have ancestors treated the way that they, they were the impact of that, that's intergenerational. So, um, in public life, no matter what I do, I'll, I'll continue to do what I can because it is a privilege, especially being elected to use your voice when you can to, to, to speak the truth and, um, to try to reverse what has happened over generations. You use the word underdogs, and Stephen Augustine, the hereditary chief, uh, has a question to say, how do we approach the overdogs, which I think is a great term, you know, the people who who do have everything, have very comfortable lives, and are, are on cruise control, basically, in their lives. How do we bring those two groups together and really make the overdogs, as he would say, care and understand the plight of the underdog. That is the challenge, I think, that I always talk about with my colleagues and people, stakeholders, is that we're all connected and I think uh, better outcomes for everyone is better for everyone at the end of the day. Uh, if, if, if we want to speak financially, even the, the justice system and the cost of you know, incarcerating people is, is far more than, than it would be to ensure that everyone has equality of opportunity. And today we can't say that everyone in, in Canada has that, that opportunity because of things that have happened. So, um, education, I think is something we can all do better with and exposure through art, through other means, um, music. I think that's all, um, going to be important that, um, but, but I would say that in order for us all to succeed and us all to be better, we all need to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Something, uh, something I see in the last number of years, it seems though there's been a real focus on economics for, for, for communities. And so in some, some communities, first nations communities, you have some people doing very well and, and other people maybe not doing so well, and there's a gap in there, and that gap, I think, is slowly starting to be addressed in some ways, but in a lot of ways, I think from a social perspective, it's not, and it's how you bridge that gap to utilize, uh, you know, both individuals, whether it's the underdogs or the overdogs, as you said, or as Stephen mentioned, that how, how do you, you know, how do you bridge that gap through education? How do you bridge that gap from an understanding perspective? Um, and I think dialogue and communication is, is the obvious one, but how do you pull those things together? And that's not easy, and it's going to take time especially when communities start doing, you know, and are doing very well in some cases, but it takes time and, and effort. And, and I think what I, what's, I think is very positive is that many of these communities, even if you look at things like uh, the graduation rate uh, has changed, you know, in the last 25 to, you know, 30 years, it's changed dramatically in a positive way in some circumstances. And uh, so things like that are very, very positive. And, but it takes time. It's a global issue as well. When you think in those terms, I, I really think that's powerful. The underdog and the overdog. It's that 1% or point, point one percent of people who hold so much wealth and don't have any experience with people who are living at this end of the spectrum. And it's, it's creating conversation and bringing people together. And I, I do think that's a role that Rolf and Friends United are 
really trying to tackle to bring different groups of people together and make sure everybody's speaking the same language, so to speak, or as one of the artists said earlier this week, approaching life as part of a human family. I think the mentorship part, that's one of the reasons why the mentorship part is important for Friends United. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you have you know, someone that's done very well, as an example in, in the art world perhaps, and others that are just beginning. And so mentoring them together, I think, has is, is helped, you know, nurture and foster uh, the beginning artist. I can't help but think of Loretta's story. Loretta and, Gould, absolutely. Yeah, and, and what simply, you know, what Rolf was able to do by giving, you know, paints and, 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 and canvas and, and other things uh, that changed her life. And she, she talks about that, of course very openly and um, sometimes the simple things you know matter and uh, so it's uh, yeah there's there's a responsibility and maybe making sure that the overachievers if you will or the the overdogs um, you know understand that they have a responsibility in their own community and and can't turn a blind eye to it well, Loretta is a great example. In fact, you know, there's that concept of we don't want you to work for us, you want, we want you to work with us. And Rolf gave Loretta the, the, the materials with which to paint, but she did the work and she learned and, and now has become one of the foremost Mi'kmaq artists in the province. In fact, the new logo of um, the brand authentication for Mi'kmaq art is uh, partly Loretta's. It's Loretta and Alan Silliboy. So that's a, a beautiful example. Yeah, she, I mean, there's, that's the great thing about the initiative here. There's, there's stories with each artist. They each have something that they brought here uh, to the other artists. And they're probably, you know, I, don't, I have no doubt that they're taking something away from it as well. And, uh, and, and really, it's only been a decade. So what's the next 10 or 20 or 30 years and beyond going to mean? I, I think it could be very, very positive, and it will be. Another artist here this week in conversations said, I would just like every Canadian to take one of the recommendations. I think it was Jason who said, one of the recommendations and do something about it, follow through. And I thought that was a very powerful you know, a powerful approach to just say, just take one. Small bites. Thank you both so much for today. Thank you. I really appreciate it.